discussing uh, the pharynx. So we talked about oral cavity in the last video. Pharynx is what we'll, uh, what we'll call just the general area for the throat. Okay, so it's common. Uh, it's a common passageway for both things that we consume, so liquids and food things like that, as well as um, air. So it's associated with the respiratory system as well. So it's it's a common passageway between the digestive systems as and the respiratory system. Now, you can take the pharynx and you can further divide it into uh, a couple of different parts. You can divide it into a uh, an oropharynx a laryngopharynx, and there's also going to be a nasopharynx, uh, but primarily with our, uh, from our digestive systems pers our perspective, we don't really talk about the nasopharynx all that much, but it is a division of the, of the pharynx as well. So as we consume material, so imagine you take a bite of something, it'll move from your mouth into your oropharynx, then your laryngopharynx, and then your esophagus, and then ultimately down into your stomach. Um, normally, food does not go into your uh, nasal pharynx. Now it can, and this is the uh, this is the rationale as to how you get things to come out of your nose. If you uh, laugh or you quickly inhale something, it will uh, enter from the oral, the mouth and oral pharynx up into the nasal pharynx, and then it can come out your your nose. So what we see is we see uh, this region. So we see a general area of our mouth, and then we have a nasal pharynx up here, oral pharynx, and laryngeal pharynx. Now, this nasopharynx up here, this is what is usually shut off when we swallow. This soft palate, along with our uvula, will raise up and close it off. But if we consume it quickly, we can bypass this, and we can get uh, material to enter up into our nasopharynx and come out our nose here. Um, but generally, it enters the mouth into this green area. Green area here is the oropharynx, then this blue area, the laryngopharynx. And whenever you see a sagittal section like this, this mid-sagittal section, you see one tube in front right here. This is one tube, and you can see another smaller tube behind it. The esophagus is always going to be located posteriorly okay, to this other tube, which this other one is the trachea associated with the uh, respiratory system. So this would be larynx here and then trachea uh, further down. So food is always, not always, but hopefully it's going to, uh, most of the time, enter into this posterior chamber, which is the esophagus. This epiglottis, when we swallow, will close over the top of the, oh, close the glottis, which is the opening to the larynx, and food will enter into our esophagus. So, speaking of our esophagus, let's discuss a little bit about its anatomy. So, it's generally 10 to 12 inches long, and it extends from our laryngo, uh, I'm sorry, uh, our laryngopharynx into our uh, stomach, okay? It has a point in which it pierces our diaphragm. So, our diaphragm is that main muscle of respiration. And there are other structures that pierce the diaphragm as well. But our esophagus will pierce it at something called the esophageal hiatus, and this is at the T10 uh, vertebral level. And then there is an, a sphincter, which is just a circular kind of muscle, uh, known as the cardiac sphincter, and also sometimes referred to as the lower esophageal sphincter. This will open and close to allow food to, uh, to enter the uh, stomach from the esophagus. Now, you've likely heard of something called... Um, you know, acid reflux, heartburn, maybe GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease. And what this is, is a condition in which uh, material that has entered the stomach along with stomach acid can regurgitate and go backwards from the stomach up into the esophagus. And, it, and this cardiac sphincter is the one that is involved with that, uh, with that process. So if we look at this picture, you can see an esophagus here, and it's piercing the diaphragm here at the esophageal hiatus. You can see right here, esophageal hiatus. Um, so as it comes down, it will um, it will enter into this region here, which is going to be our stomach, specifically our, our cardiac portion of the stomach, and then we have a fundus uh, portion over here. Uh, but this circular kind of group of muscle here, this is going to be our um, cardiac sphincter or our lower esophageal sphincter. So. What you can also see is how the tissue of this esophagus here slowly changes from this nice smooth into this kind of more uh, rigid, uh, jagged area down here. So you actually have the epithelium of the esophagus. It changes once it gets to this uh, kind of this junction here between the esophagus and the stomach. 
So epithelial tissue of our esophagus is going to be stratified uh, squamous. And then the epithelium of our stomach is going to be simple columnar. So there is actually a difference in the um, epithelium lining these two uh, areas. Now, you can get something called uh, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD. When you have chronic GERD, you have chronic reflux of acid from the stomach region up into the esophagus, so th through this cardiac sphincter. And what happens is, uh, over time, if it is persistent enough, you can have the epithelium in your esophagus change uh, from stratified squamous into simple columnar, um, and that's something known as Barrett's esophagus, and then the, the development of Barrett's esophagus uh, increases your risk of developing uh, esophageal cancer. And so you can give uh, medications that inhibit acid production in the stomach, so if you inhibit acid production, hopefully you thus inhibit the reflux of acid from the stomach into the esophagus. So. Uh, we'll look here and you can answer some of these questions. Feel free to pause, pause the video and answer these and we'll continue on. So what are the layers of our digestive tract from superficial to deep? What is the function of salivary amylase? And where does our digestive uh, tract receive its blood supply? And then you can also answer where is it uh, and how is it drained? So we'll talk about getting um, food material ingested things from our uh, mouth to our esophagus. So the first thing that we do, and you know this anytime you have eat, you've started to eat something, now you may not have thought about it, but, but it happens, is you have to chew. So the, the, the term for chewing is mastication, and so you'll use uh, muscles of mastication, which include your uh, masseter muscle, your temporalis muscle, as well as uh, some smaller muscles known as your pterygoid muscles. All of these have to do with the, uh, the movement of your... Um, of your jaw, so your mandible, uh, closing it and opening it to, um, to allow for chewing. So after we chew, we're going to swallow. Okay, We're going to swallow the food that we have now chewed and both uh, physically, uh, mechanically, and chemically digested. So when we go into this swallowing or deglutition phase, uh, there is going to be a couple of sub-phases. So we have a buccal phase, we have a pharyngeal phase, and we have an esophageal phase. So we start with the buccal phase, which is in, uh, I'm sorry, which is voluntary. So this is when we have food in our mouth and we voluntarily move it backwards, uh, posteriorly, into our oral pharynx. Okay, so we can voluntarily do this. As you're chewing, you can voluntarily move food from your mouth posteriorly into your pharynx or your oral pharynx. So as we are saying, the of swallowing is really just this voluntary phase in which you're moving um, uh, ingested material from your mouth to your uh, oral pharynx. You then follow this up by uh, with the pharyngeal phase of swallowing, and this is going to be an involuntary phase in which you are now beginning to squeeze food posteriorly down your uh, pharynx. You will have your uvula uh, uh, move upward to help close off the nasal pharynx so food doesn't accidentally enter the nasal cavity. You'll also have the uh, epiglottis fold over uh, the glottis, which is the opening uh, down into the larynx and trachea to prevent food from accidentally entering the uh, trachea, the larynx and trachea. When this does happen, and it can happen sometimes, we call that aspiration. Whenever you have food uh, and other ingested materials enter the trachea as opposed to the esophagus. And then after this phase, we'll eventually get to the esophageal phase, which is another involuntary phase. And this is whenever food material actually enters the esophagus and is um, squeezed down uh, inferiorly toward the uh, stomach. So this squeezing motion uh, of the esophagus, esophagus is known as peristalsis. So you have these uh, peristaltic contractions which force um, food and squeeze it down, essentially uh, squeeze it down the esophagus toward the stomach. So once we enter the stomach, this is just where food is uh, entering after it's being uh, squeezed down uh, the esophagus. So you'll have the uh, cardiac sphincter or that lower esophageal sphincter somewhat uh, in, a, in a relaxed position to allow uh, material to pass through it and enter the stomach. So what we see here is a, is a large stomach here. And then you can see 
uh, this small little region right here. This is going to be your uh, this is going to be your esophagus that is uh, joining into the stomach here, and then it would be piercing the diaphragm uh, up here uh, at the T10 vertebral level. Now, we can see some parts as we're entering in. So we have the esophagus with our lower esophageal or cardiac sphincter, and then we have different regions of our stomach. So this region right here, this is known as the cardia or the cardiac region. You have a fundus or uh, fundic region. You have a general body and then you have a pyloric region as, uh, as well right here. You can also note some of these curvatures. You have a, you have a lesser curvature and a greater curvature, and there are different arteries uh, and vessels that run along these different uh, curvatures. And then from the pylorus, you'll go through the pyloric sphincter and into this most proximal aspect of the small intestine known as the duodenum. So uh, whenever we look at our stomach uh, microscopically and histologically, uh, we can see uh, some of those uh, previous layers that we've already discussed. So we can see a, a, a muscularis external layer. And in the stomach specifically, remember, we will have three layers as opposed to two. So you'll have a circular and a longitudinal as you normally do. But in the stomach, you'll add a third layer, which is known as the oblique layer. And it's just um, oriented slightly differently. Now, we have epithelium, which is going to... Uh, be a part of our mucosa of our stomach. And in the stomach, as we mentioned, it will contain simple columnar uh, cells and, and specifically non-ciliated. We have ciliated uh, simple columnar in different places, but in the stomach it will be non-ciliated. And then dispersed throughout, we will have these cells known as goblet cells. And these goblet cells will serve to produce um, mucus that will coat the lining of our, of our stomach to help protect it from the uh, harsh uh, stomach acid, the harsh hydrochloric acid that we have uh, secreted there. Now, whenever we look in, in the next picture, we'll see this. We have these regions of our uh, of our stomach and the mucosa that kind of make these invaginations and dip down. These are going to be called gastric pits. And further down, we have gastric glands. So we'll take a look here. What you can see is you can see it on the on the left image, and you can also see it on the right image. You have these gastric pits which are going to be these, uh, these small little invaginations here that kind of dip down. And then further down, you have a gastric gland, which is all this down here. Now, these gastric glands, whenever we look here, we see that there are different ones. So we have, um, uh, or I'm sorry, within the gastric gland, we have different cells. So we have parietal cells, we have chief cells, we have enteroendocrine cells, uh, mucus neck cells. And all of these are going to produce different things um, uh, within the cell and then secrete them into this uh, gastric pit and then from the pit it will enter into the uh, lumen of the stomach. So we'll look at exactly what those uh, what those products are and what they are needed for uh, in terms of digestion. So what we have are different cells that line these these gastric glands. So you have mu mucus neck cells that uh, secrete mucus as their name suggests. You have parietal cells. Uh, parietal cells secrete um, hydrochloric acid as well as something called intrinsic factor, and I'll come back to intrinsic factor in just a second. We have cells called chief cells, which secrete pepsinogen. Anytime you see this ending O-G-E-N, it almost always means that this uh, molecule uh, is, a, is in an inactive form. And so that's exactly what we see here. Pepsinogen is the inactive form of pepsin. Uh, and then we'll convert pepsinogen to pepsin via the hydrochloric acid from the parietal cell. And pepsin is a protease, so it's a, it is an enzyme that helps to break down uh, proteins. We then have enteroendocrine cells. Uh, the most common one is the G cell, uh, which uh, secretes this hormone called gastrin. And we'll, and we'll discuss gastrin uh, separately in a little bit. And then you just have general stem cells, which are dividing and replacing some of these older cells every so often. So I said I'd come back to parietal cell and how it, uh, how it uh, functions in this intrinsic factor aspect. So intrinsic factor is this uh, chemical which is needed for the absorption of vitamin B12. And so vitamin B12 is necessary for the uh, production of uh, red blood cells. And so whenever you don't have intrinsic factor, there are conditions in which you uh, do not produce intrinsic factor in your parietal cell. This is known as pernicious anemia. And so anemia is just a general term that refers to a decreased 
Uh, sometimes it can refer to just a decreased red blood cell count or sometimes just a decreased ability to carry oxygen. And so what pernicious anemia is, is whenever you lack this intrinsic factor, you're not able to absorb vitamin B12, and so you're not able to make and synthesize red blood cells. And so these uh, patients with pernicious anemia are forced to uh, take uh, B12 uh, injections. And so uh, the B12 injections will go directly into the blood, so that there's no need for it to be absorbed because you directly administer it into the blood. It wouldn't make sense to give patients with pernicious anemia B12 supplements because if they take the supplement, they still they still have to ingest it. Uh, but either way, they're they're still not able to absorb it because they still lack the intrinsic factor. So B12 supplements that they ingest really wouldn't do them any good. It has to be a B12 injection. So here are some of these cells that we talked about. So our mucus cells, uh, parietal cells that secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. We can see uh, chief cells that secrete uh, pepsinogen. And then we can see G cells that secrete the hormone gastrin. And we'll talk about gastrin uh, in more detail later. So as we uh, begin our digestive processes, we have to secrete uh, acid and different secretions that will be used for the breakdown of, what are, of whatever it is we're going to ingest. So we can divide our, our phases of digestion uh, into three different parts. We have a cephalic phase. We have a gastric phase and then an intestinal phase. And so we'll start with cephalic. So cephalic has to do with the head. Anytime you see the word cephalo or cephalic, think head. So the cephalic phase is really digestion that's beginning in the head, or you can almost think of it in the brain and in the mind. It can occur whenever we see food, when we think about it, when we smell it, uh, anything like this. And if we just briefly taste it, we will begin to... Uh, secrete uh, salivary uh, uh, so, uh, well, so saliva with salivary enzymes. We will then secrete gastric uh, secretions in the stomach in preparation for uh, the arrival of this food that we're either seeing or thinking or uh, or smelling or something like that. So it can really occur before you even ingest food at all. Now, once we ingest it and it enters our stomach, we'll then have an additional amount of um, acid uh, secrete, uh, secreted as well as will stimulate gastric activity, so the motility. Uh, most of the secretions in our stomach, most of the acid secretions come from this phase, so the gastric phase once food actually enters the stomach. And then different chemicals uh, and different hormones and neurotransmitters in our, uh, related to our gastrointestinal system can increase gastric acid uh, production and gastric secretions. So acetylcholine is one, it's a primary, it's a, it's a large parasympathetic neurotransmitter, and the secretion of gastric um, secretions uh, is increased to be a parasympathetic stimulation. Uh, you have histamine, so you can have H2, um, which is just a histamine 2 blocker as a medication, and this can reduce the amount of acid produced in patients who produce too much acid. And then again, the gastrin hormone that we've, that we've brought up. So all three of these can uh, stimulate our parietal cells to secrete uh, hydrochloric acid. We'll, we'll look next at exactly how we make this hydrochloric acid and how we, um, how we make it within our parietal cells. So what we have is in our cells during normal cellular, uh, cellular respiration and carbohydrate metabolism, we have water and we have uh, carbon dioxide. So this water and carbon dioxide will combine and when it combines, it forms carbonic acid, which is this H2CO3. Uh, and the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction between water and carbon dioxide to form carbonic acid is carbonic anhydrase. This carbonic acid then dissociates and splits into two molecules, a bicarbonate molecule and a hydrogen uh, ion. Now, the, the uh, Bicarbonate ion is pumped into the blood in exchange for a chloride ion, and so this is sometimes known as the chloride shift, where you pump out a bicarbonate and you pump in a chloride ion. And the hydrogen is uh, exchanged for a uh, potassium via this uh, hydrogen potassium pump over here. And so what you end up having is lots of hydrogens pumped into the lumen 
uh, of the stomach or the limit of the gastric pit. You have that chloride that we brought in. It just continues all the way over into the lumen. And what you get is the hydrogen combining with the lumen. I'm sorry, the hydrogen combining with the, uh, with the chloride ion. And when these two form, you get your hydrochloric acid. Uh, and remember, all of this is taking place within our uh, parietal cells and our gastric uh, glands. So uh, the intestinal phase is the last phase uh, that we'll discuss. And so this has to do once food has, we, we've ingested it, we've swallowed it, it's gone from our stomach, and now it has entered into our uh, small intestine, so the first part. Now, what we have is our, our duodenum, the first part of our small intestine, actually uh, regulating um, the activity of the stomach. And so what you have is initially, whenever food enters the duodenum, you'll have stretching of the duodenum, uh, that stimulate the stomach, and this stomach will then produce more, um, uh, more gastrin, so more of this, um, this hormone that we'll that we'll discuss in a second, and how it involves uh, getting uh, substances out of the stomach. Uh, the gastrin does, and then you'll have uh, after this, you'll have something known as the enterogastric reflex. And so, what this is is after some time, the uh, duodenum will then send signals to the stomach that inhibit it and decrease its activity, decrease the stomach's activity. So decrease um, acid production, decrease motility. And this is all because now food has moved into the uh, intestine, so we want to decrease the ability uh, and decrease the activity of the, uh, of the stomach from sending more uh, material into the small intestine. So after we have uh, all this, we'll have, uh, th this, uh, this is just discussing our our stomach filling. And so what we have is something known as reflex mediated relaxation and plasticity. And this can allow the stomach to increase uh, increase in size to accommodate increased food coming in, as well as keeping the internal pressure of your uh, stomach appropriate. Now, you have these cells in the stomach known as the cells of Cahal or Cajal, as well as uh, they're also called pacemaker cells. And they establish this baseline activity of the uh, smooth muscle in our stomach. So when the smooth muscle contracts, it will form these peristaltic contractions, which uh, mix um, chyme. And chyme is just this term for material that we have adjusted and broken down, and then it combines with hydrochloric acid and different secretions, which is called that chyme. And then ultimately, we'll have gastric emptying, uh, which we talked about, it moving into the uh, small intestine, so the duodenum, the, the first part. Now, so we've discussed now the, uh, the food entering the stomach, and then it leaves the stomach and it enters into the small intestine. So let's take a look at some of the features of our, of our small intestine. So we have a duodenum, which is the first part. We have a jejunum here, which is the middle part. And then we have an ileum, which is our third and most distal part. It is the main place where we have lots of uh, digestion happening. We have some absorption happening here as well. We have a pyloric sphincter, and we have something known as the ileocecal valve. Pyloric sphincter, as we've seen, is controlling movement of material from the stomach into the duodenum. And then the ileocecal valve is controlling the movement of material from the ileum into the cecum. And we'll look at exactly what those are. And so, the duodenum is going to be our first part. It's the most proximal. It's about 10 inches long. Uh, it's connected to the stomach at the pyloric sphincter. And this is going to receive different products from both the... Uh, it's going to receive uh, products from the stomach. It's going to receive products from the pancreas. And it's going to receive products from the... Uh, ultimately from the uh, gallbladder via... Uh, that is bile. And so, we'll take a look at some of these. So, what you can see highlighted in this left image is the... Uh, duodenum. So it's this really short, it's not very long at all, and it's divided into roughly four parts. So you see part one, part two, part three, and then this fourth part here. And then on the right, you can just see this most proximal aspect here. So you can see roughly parts one and part two. And now here, we can see th this on the left here, this is a portion of the duodenum, and then you can see it over here as well. Now what we see on the left is the pancreas, and this is the pancreatic duct. And this pancreatic duct is traveling down and will empty its contents into the duodenum. And that's what we see right here on the right. This is the 
pancreatic duct, it's going to join with this duct known as the common bile duct. And where they join, it's going to create this hepatopancreatic ampulla, and then it will drain its contents. So it'll drain bile, as well as pancreatic enzymes and juices into the duodenum here. And this, this little bulge here is known as the major duodenal papilla, and the smaller one up here is the minor duodenal papilla. Uh, this, this little duct here, we don't mention it a whole lot, but this is the accessory pancreatic duct. And so from the gallbladder, you'll have bile uh, in here flowing through the cystic duct, joining with the uh, common hepatic duct to, join the, to form the common bile duct, and then it will ultimately drain its contents into the duodenum. Now, the middle portion of our small intestine is known as the jejunum. It's roughly 8 inches long, and then our ileum is going to be the most distal aspect, which is about 12 inches long. Um, what we have... Uh, is uh, uh, the the ileum uh, joining with the cecum at this ileocecal valve, and so what this uh, ileocecal valve is is it is controlling the passage of material from the uh, ileum into the cecum. So if we take a look at a picture here, uh, what you can see is um, the jejunum being located a little more superiorly, and then this distal aspect and on this you can see it really nicely where this distal portion is actually traveling and entering into uh, the cecum here and at this point you would have your uh, ileocecal valve. Now our small intestine it also has some histological features just as our stomach did and so what we'll see is something known as plicae circularis, and these means circular folds, uh, essentially. And what these are is they're permanent ridges within the small intestine, and they help to mix the chyme that has entered the small intestine, as well as to help with a little bit of absorption as well. We have villi, and so villi is plural, villus is singular, and these are small finger-like projections that extend off of the surface of our uh, uh, intestinal cells, and they help to increase surface area. When you look on the surface of a villus, so you take one of these villus, uh, one of these villi, and you look on the surface, you'll see a small cell, and on the surface of that small cell, you will see microvilli. And so in this next picture, I'll, I'll show you, uh, or in two pictures, I'll show you. Um, uh, the microvilli uh, create a, a structure known as the brush border sometimes, and there are brush border enzymes that come from this microvilli uh, region, and so we'll take a look uh, at exactly what those are. So here you can see plicae circularis, these little ridges, uh, these permanent ridges in the lumen of our small intestine. Over here to the right, you can see a large uh, villus, this large structure coming up. Uh, you can also see uh, individual cells all along here, so we took one of them and blew it up, and then on the surface of the cell, you can see these smaller ridges, and these are the microvilli. Okay, so we can see it here as well. We see villi on the left. In the middle, we zoomed in on an individual cell. So say this is an individual cell here, and on the border of it, you see these similar projections. They look similar to these on the right, but they're a lot smaller. These are the microvilli. Okay. Now note in this middle picture, you can see this band of kind of darker red tissue. This is uh, the, uh, the brush border that, that we referred to. Now, uh, this brush border is made up of all of these uh, microvilli extending off uh, their apical surface. And from this brush border, you have different um, uh, brush border enzymes that help to digest uh, carbohydrates and different proteins. So our histology wall, we also have different types of cells. So we have absorptive cells. Uh, which are the ones we just looked at with microvilli. We have goblet cells, so if we go back, you can see a large goblet cell right here, and these are going to secrete, uh, secrete mucus. And the idea of mucus being secreted in the intestines is that the, the material coming from the, uh, from the, um, from the stomach uh, has a low pH, so it's very acidic. The, the small intestine isn't really isn't supposed to and doesn't want to come in contact with that uh, high acidic content. And so it secretes this mucus that lines the intestinal wall and that helps protect it from the incoming uh, acidic material from the stomach. You have 
uh, enteroendocrine cells uh, as well, which helps secrete different hormones, and we'll talk about what cholecystokinin is. And then we have um, PANF cells, uh, and PANF cells have to do with our immune system that help to destroy uh, harmful bacteria. We'll also mention how there is, uh, there is normal bacteria uh, in our gut, that is our, our normal flora, if you will, which is, which is helpful to us and is bacteria that we actually need. So in our intestines, similar to what we had in our stomach, we have these little uh, invaginations. And so what these are called, these are crypts, uh, intestinal crypts, and uh, they secrete our intestinal juices and these different uh, uh, substances that are coming from our intestine. So they're sometimes also referred to as uh, crypts of labricum, uh, but they're essentially just these these cavities in between adjacent villi that secrete different intestinal uh, products. Now, if we look further deep into the uh, wall of the intestine, we'll see uh, within the submucosa, we'll see something known as Peyer's patches, and then we'll see Brunner's glands. So Peyer's patches are going to be related to the lymphatic system, and they're a, they're a mucosa or they're a, they're a lymphatic um, uh, nodule, essentially. Uh, they're primarily in the ileum, so that most distal aspect of our small intestine. But they contain uh, regions of uh, lymphatic and immune cells that serve uh, in our uh, lymphatic and immune systems. We also have something known as a Brunner's gland, and these Brunner gland help to also produce more mucus uh, from the submucosa that lie in our intestines to help neutralize any uh, acidic uh, contents coming from the stomach. So they're they're located primarily in the uh, in the duodenum. So if we look at this picture here, you can see these villi, these large extensions off the top. On one individual cell, we see it, we see microvilli. Um, in between, you see uh, a crypt, an intestinal crypt, kind of coming down here in between adjacent villi. Um, you can see some goblet cells as well. And then further down, we see uh, Brunner's glands uh, as well. And then further in here, we would also have some, uh, if this was in the ileum, we could see some of our pyrus patches as well uh, that exist way down here in this uh, submucosa of the small intestine. So we'll stop here, and then we'll pick up with the next part.